Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you for joining us for How to Capture Donors and Keep Them with Jeff Brooks. Today's webinar is presented by the Community First Foundation and Cause Planet. I'd like to begin by introducing your co-host, Dana Rinderneck. Dana, do you want to say hello to everybody? Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Wonderful. Let's go ahead, Dana, and uh, go over some announcements that you have. All right. I just want to remind everybody we have passed the deadline to get your profiles done. We appreciate everybody uh, submitting and getting new profiles in, as well as those of you that updated. We do have some upcoming dates I want you to be aware of. October 5th, we will be doing Countdown to Colorado Gives Day, another webinar just giving you those top tricks to getting ready for the day. Uh, then November 1st, schedule donations open. I can't believe it's already here. The last day to edit your profile <laughs> and make it beautiful is November 17th. We will be doing a rally at the State Capitol on November 28th. And if, you're near, and if you are in one of our regional areas, there will be rallies in your area as well. So uh, watch for those dates. Of course, Colorado Gives Day is December 5th. So, well, just what, three, four months away. And then we will have the money into your bank accounts by December 31st for all the money you raised on Colorado Gives Day and the incentive fund. And then the rest of the money you raised in December, including any prize money you might have won, will be to you by January 23rd. So I do want to let everybody know this is not a normal webinar in that we don't have Bryce and Lisa answering questions on there. So if you have questions specifically about Colorado Gives Day and your Colorado Gives information, don't forget that you can email us at cogives at communityfirstfoundation.org and we'll answer those questions for you. I'm really looking forward to this. I think Jeff's going to teach us lots. So let's turn it back over to uh, Denise and Jeff. Great. Thanks so much, Dana. That's exciting. Four months away. That's, that's a good amount of time to start thinking about the topics we're going to talk about today. I want to introduce you to the Cause Planet team. My name is Denise McMahon. I'm the founder and publisher at Cause Planet. We're a professional development resource for nonprofits. And with me is Amy Warner. She helps us out with our leadership training. Amy, do you want to say hello? Hi, guys. Welcome. And if you have any questions, please ask in the chat bar, and I'll be posting some uh, information that Jeff's giving as we go along. Great. Thanks, Amy. Well, we are going to now introduce your featured guest, Jeff Brooks. Jeff has been in the nonprofit sector for 30 years, and he's the author of three great books, uh, The Fundraiser's Guide to Irresistible Communications, The Money-Raising Nonprofit Brand, and How to Turn Your Words into Money. His website is futurefundraisingnow.com. We are big fans of this website. Um, he produces regular uh, podcasts as well as blog posts. So really encourage you to check that out. Really great um, content-rich information. Some of Jeff's clients have included the Salvation Army, the Ronald McDonald House, World Vision, Feeding America, and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Jeff, hello and welcome. Oh, it's great to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, well, let's go ahead, um, Jeff. We're going to tell everybody about our agenda and format. So um, let's talk a little bit about that. So everyone, you know, Dana mentioned this is a normal webinar. Well, today we're going to be asking Jeff some questions, and, and he'll be giving us some answers. We'll be asking you to fire up your keyboards and polling you every now and then throughout the session. And if you'd like to join us on any one of the topics throughout the hour, um, feel free to um, join us in the, um, in the conversation using the chat bar. As Amy said, she'll be facilitating that. So any questions that you ask us will be submitted um, anonymously, and we'll be sure to handle those um, with the group when they come up. And then after our uh, main session, we'll be doing a Q&A for the endowment partners. So endowment partners, Hang on after the top of the hour, and we'll be sure to answer any questions that you might have as well. So let's go ahead and talk about what's in store for today's webinar. We're going to, of course, talk about capturing donors and how to keep them. We're also going to discuss targeting the right donors through your organization. 
designing with impact, and creating effective fundraising copy, and of course, avoiding common myths to keep retention strong, and lastly, enhancing retention through your donor relationship. And one of the things I always like to do before we kick off with the first slide for um, Jeff is to, like I said, fire up those keyboards and get you guys thinking about some of these topics. So the first question that I have for all of you is um, that your nonprofit brand can provide important context for effective fundraising. So how many of you feel your brand supports your retention efforts? You can answer um, yes, no, or not sure. So feel free to weigh in there. Again, we're talking about your brand and how that supports your retention and fundraising efforts. How many of you feel like your brand is doing that for you? Let's answer yes, no, or not sure. Oh, good. I can see already you guys are chiming in with those keyboards. I love it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and skip to results so we can uh, see what some of, some of these answers are looking like. Okay, so it looks like about half of you are not sure if your brand is supporting your retention and fundraising efforts. Um, and then 40% of you think your brand is, and another 10% roughly are saying no. So, um, so Jeff, let's dive into this topic now that everybody's kind of given us um, their thoughts on it. I thought the best way to talk about um, retention and fundraising is really just to talk about the context of branding and what that can do for you. So tell us why mm -hmm. personal branding does not work for nonprofit organizations. I love that you tackle it from this, from this point of view. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like that you have um, uh, two of the brand uh, logos you're showing there are just classic, classic, very well-constructed commercial brands, and that would be Apple and Nike. And what both of them do is they don't sell uh, – Apple doesn't, at the brand level, doesn't sell computers or phones or iPads. It sells the idea of creativity and being different. And Nike, similarly, they don't sell shoes. They sell the idea of the competitive spirit. And they do that really well. And, and by doing that and doing it well, they've risen above you know, the, the plastic and metal and, and glass and stuff that they're selling to the idea of what they're selling. So that, that's a very successful thing in the commercial world to do. And I, I'm not saying anything about Adidas. I just don't know them very well. Now, what happens uh, sometimes is these, this, the idea of let's rise above what we actually sell, what we actually do, and go to sort of the abstract ideal. When you bring that into nonprofit world, you end up kind of losing the whole point that people give to you. Because in the nonprofit world and in the fundraising world, we're here for the specifics, and our donors are here for the specifics. So if you are a homeless shelter and you are feeding um, and sheltering homeless people, that's what you're selling. You're not selling the idea of hope or whatever it is that, that also is coming along with that. Because, and that's abstract, and people don't donate to abstractions. And I can prove that. Uh, because every time I've seen uh, an organization kind of go from selling what they do to this commercial brand high aspirations thing, they lose donors. They, donors pour out the doors and don't come back. And I don't think it's that they're mad. I think it's that they're just no longer involved. So that's, that's where, and it can be highly, highly damaging, and it happens all the time, that a nonprofit brings in um, commercial branding gurus who tell them, yeah, we're going to turn your, we turn your world upside down in a good way. You're going to get a lot more donations, a lot more um, people involved. They do that, and it doesn't, not only does it not happen, but they, they lose anywhere from uh, 25 to 50% of their donors within a year. That is what happens when you go that way. Nonprofit brands are a different thing. Really, really interesting. I love that. I love that you talk about the two because I think a lot of times nonprofits look to the corporate sector and say, oh, that's what we should be doing. And so I love that we're having this conversation to begin with. It's a, it's a great way to set the stage. Well, let's go ahead and shift gears to um, imagery. Um, let's talk to everybody about that. So the question we have posed for you is how does my organization use imagery that reminds donors why they care about our cause. 
Yeah, what you, what you want to do, and, and what what often happens um, with, with with nonprofit imagery is they they have a they have images that contradict the story they're trying to tell. Um, I see this so often where um, it, it might it's, maybe it's a poverty related organization and they're trying to make the point that we're having a, there's a problem there's there's a famine in Africa or there's a homeless crisis in our community or, or um, kids kids are struggling in school you know. It, it, they're trying to tell us there's a problem that they want to solve, but the image says exactly the opposite. They show smiling, happy, healthy people that don't look like there's anything wrong. Uh, that's a big problem because we know that visual images are um, processed much, much faster than the words and are much more believable because they go straight into the emotional centers of our brain. So when you do that, you are basically saying there's no problem, don't give. And you're saying it about five times louder than your words are saying, there's a problem, will you please join us and help solve it? So you really got to really have to watch that and make sure that your words and images tell the same story. Okay, great. Well, let's go ahead and jump to another poll. Everybody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question before we jump into the topic of differentiation. Um, and the question is, let's talk about communication strategies. Are your donors motivated to renew their gift because your organization does great work? Yes, no, or not sure. So are folks giving to you because of what your organization is doing? So let's, let's go ahead and touch on that. So it looks like, um, good, thanks everybody. Thanks for voting. So it looks like so far, um, about 60% are saying that donors are motivated by the organization doing great work. And then about 35% are saying they're not sure. So this is sort of a trick question, um, and Jeff knows this, but I think it raises an important point. And I'd love for you, Jeff, to talk about um, why donors give, because somebody is great, and I think you'll be surprised by the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I voted not sure on that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> um, and I voted not sure because, in a sense, they, they, you do need to be great, and you don't deserve any any dollars of support from donors if you're not great. But that's not what's why they're giving. They're giving to uh, put their values into work. They're not giving because you do great work. Uh, again, that's doesn't get anyone off the hook, you have to be great, and they expect you to be great, but they're not motivated by your greatness. So really, it's, it's their own greatness that causes them to give. So you want to speak into that reality, which is uh, another way of thinking about this is they're not giving to support your organization. They're giving to put feet on their values. So you have to, just, you have to be in their world and talk about those issues, not look how long we've been around, we have the best trained people, our processes are superb. Those are all important, but they're not why they give. So talk to them about their values and how their dollars put the values to work. Treat them like the heroes they are because they change the world through you. Talk to them about that. Uh, get back to them when they give quickly and thank them with, with gratefulness and then tell them what their dollars have done. And that's an ongoing process. And, and what you do, when you do all those things, you have to build a relationship with donors and it's a realistic relationship. I know it looks to us from where we sit in our offices like all these people, these excellent people are supporting us because they realize that we're great. And that's just not how it is. I mean, that's a, that's a little piece of the reality, but it's not the core of the reality. The reality is there's people out there with personal life missions, things they care about, things they want to change or make better about the world and they seek around for organizations that can be the outlet for their values. That's what's really happening to them. So rather than think of how many people can we entice onto our bandwagon, you want to think of it the other way around and think how many bandwagons can we get onto by being attractive to the people who want to change the world. Wonderful. Well, and we have a question here in the chat bar. Um, uh, one of our participants is asking, how do we tie this in with using emotion and, and uh, creating an emotional connection to donors. Could you talk a little bit about using emotion? Yeah. 
Well, I think if you do that and do it well, it's automatically emotional. Uh, and, and maybe the, the caveat there is you're not going to show them that you are worth their support by giving them a pile of numbers. Uh, that, that does not work. It doesn't, um, people don't make their decisions rationally. What you do have to do is tell the story of what's broken or what's incomplete or what's the opportunity and how they can enter that story and, and uh, change it. So that, and that's a highly emotional way to approach it. Uh, I know, again, a lot of us try to use the rational argument. Join us because of these excellent reasons, our, our excellence, our greatness, our people. Uh, and those actually are reasons to give, but they're not the reasons that motivate. Right? Um, it, it's more like if you don't have those things, you need to be, get out of the game because you don't deserve anybody's support. <laughs> but, so the, the thing to do is be great and then show them how they are great when they give to you with stories and not with uh, facts and numbers. Okay. Um, and, and on this topic, you know, I know in, in your book you talk about how it's important not to get caught up in kind of the creative versus old-fashioned argument. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, you say to avoid fonts that are creative but hard to read, sort of kind of stylistic um, issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, yeah, I kind of hate it that, people, that it sort of feels like there's a, there's a difference between creative and old-fashioned and because there really isn't yeah. old-fashioned has to be creative too. Uh, but, I, but I know what you mean. Um, a lot of the times when people say creative, they mean cutting edge and modern and interesting and things like that. And I've got to warn you away, don't do those things. Um, there's several reasons. One is that it's usually harder to read, and that's death. Uh, it's, it's, that's not what makes people give. If people can't read, they're just not going to move to the next step. Uh, the second thing is the large majority of donors are older people. And you're just going to do better, but when you uh, look old-fashioned, corny, even, uh, because to them, that's the way design was when they were young, and they still think it's cool. And this is going to happen to all of us. All of us are going to age, and we're going to our idea of what's cool is going to age with us. And and that's why our parents and grandparents are kind of we think they're weird. It's because they they have a different style they're carrying with them. So if you care about reaching donors, you need to be in their world. Uh, and I've never really seen a, a cutting-edge modern kind of design work well in fundraising. And I think it's those two reasons. One, one is the readability, and two is it just doesn't connect well with the majority of donors. Okay, terrific. Thanks for commenting on that. It's a good reminder that, you know, there's that faithful contingency out there, the older the older set who continue to give, um, and, and I know you've blogged before about, you know, chasing the unicorn, um, <laughs> and, you know, it's important, to, it's important to stay focused on the real traditional um, direct mail donors, so that's great. Yeah. I mean, okay, well, let's go, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, direct mail, it's kind of an interesting way to think about it, is a lot of us don't like direct mail for a variety of reasons. And one of them is it's kind of junky looking. Oh, well, there's a reason it's junky looking. And that, that's what works. It works in commercial direct mail and works in, um, in uh, nonprofit fundraising. And it's because of who the audience is. Direct mail is, is an older person's medium. Um, younger people aren't really in the direct mail game. So, you know, when you try to do cool looking direct mail, you're, you're missing the boat in about four different ways. So, uh, you know, just let it be, let, you know, swallow your pride and be in the world that you're in, which is older people, people who are not thinking about design, and just direct mail itself. Perfect. Okay, great. All right, everybody. Well, we're going to jump to um, how my organization uses drama to pull in donors effectively. Um, Jeff, could you talk about these two mistakes with drama? Yeah. Well, I... I think this is important because um, I, I always tell people, tell dramatic stories. And then in any audience of, of fundraisers that I'm saying this to, there's a bunch of people saying, yeah, but our organization doesn't have drama. You know, we're, we're a, a ballet company <laughs> or an art museum or, or a, community, you know, a community museum or something. And they say, we don't have drama. Um, and or they just don't. They just don't think about drama. So I, I always say, well, I think everybody has drama, but you have to make a couple of, of 
shifts in thinking to understand, yes, we do have drama. So what, one way of looking at that is some organizations think we're not dramatic because what we do is just kind of boring. Classic example of this um, is this wonderful organization I've worked with before. I love them. They're called Bread for the World. They are a anti-hunger, anti-poverty organization, but what they don't go out to the third world and give out food or train farmers or work on infrastructure. They don't do any of that. They work with on laws and they lobby and they write white papers and they testify at hearings. And it's all really boring. And if they concentrated on their processes, nobody would donate to them because it, you, you can't, your, your heart does not swell when you hear what they do. They've learned mm -hmm. to talk about the outcome. And the outcome is amazing. The outcome is poverty is massively reduced. And they, they've actually been able to say this much money can save this many lives because of the way we work. And then they don't really talk about the processes because it's not interesting. It's actually the same with a lot of food banks and, and Feeding America, which is sort of the national food bank. Basically, if you saw what Feeding America does is people sitting at desks writing emails and talking on the phone. And what they're doing is they're sourcing food that's going to go into the waste stream and getting it into the food banks. So they, they used to talk about it. We source food and we call, we call food producers and they weren't raising any money and then they finally figured out, oh, wait a minute, there's an end product there and it's hungry families and children getting the food that they urgently need. So, and then suddenly they took off. So that's one thing. Talk about the outcomes, not the process. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, we tend to give examples that are about saving lives and getting, you know, getting people off the streets, sort of these more dramatic things. But these life and death things aren't the only things that matter in life. And that's, this especially maybe applies to um, arts organization where, you know, if the show doesn't go on, nobody dies, right? Uh, and you might mm -hmm. feel sort of uh, inferior because, well, all these other charities, you know, if somebody dies or, or uh, puppies die and uh, we can't compete with that drama. Well, you can't compete with the life or death part, but you can compete with the story and the drama because you're talking to your audience of people who get it. If we didn't have live classical music in our community, that would be an actual tragedy. <laughs> and you're talking to people who get that. And so talk about that. That's your story. And approach it with the drama that it, that it uh, has in it. And don't worry that it's not life and death. It's still dramatic. Okay, great. Well, and we have a question on the chat bar. Someone's asking, you know, what about um, organizations that have an abundance of drama, um, for example, mental health and death, um, does it, is it beneficial to try and lighten the mood in that case to, to kind of temper the amount of drama? Um, I don't think so. I, um, I'd have to think more about this, but my, my, my first, first answer is no, 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 no. Don't even think about doing that. Um, and, and the reason I say that is you might – you know, from where you sit, there's too much drama. It's like something going on every day. I, I, uh, somebody once told me, I worked with an uh, international relief organization, and they said, and we were talking about emergencies, and in, in my world, uh, there's an international emergency approximately once a year. So, you know, we're talking about a major hurricane or earthquake or something like that. They said, no, there's about 100 emergencies a year. You know, 100 documented mm -hmm. UN uh, emergencies, up to a week. And so in, in their mm -hmm. life, they're, they're kind of, there's too much drama. You know, they, and for them to kind of be sane and calm and functional, yeah. they kind of have to downplay. Our donors are not sitting in the same chair we're sitting in. You've got to pump up the drama because they're not hearing these things. And, in fact, even the big, only the very biggest emergencies get through to them. You know, the fact that there's 5,000 homeless people on the streets of, of my community uh, I think that's kind of emergency, uh, and I'd say most people here don't know that. Uh, so we have to tell that story, and again, not the fact that it's 5,000, but that it's individuals who are suffering. Okay. Well, we've clearly, um, uh, you know, hit a hit a pressure point here because now we're we're um, fine tuning this topic. A follow-up question is, what about creating a false idea about what is going on by creating too much drama or fo focusing on it too much? So I guess the question might be about, you know, accur accuracy and portraying that level of drama. Yeah. Well, we, we can't ever 
uh, stretch the truth or or uh, or um, give people a wrong idea. That's uh, um, we can't do that. Um, yeah. But I have to tell you, um, far 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 more fundraising uh, fails to make it clear how serious things are than overplays it. I know some does, and they might give you the impression that's not the way it is. Um, but if you are you're honestly dealing with a problem in the world or in the community or wherever it is, you need to tell the story of the problem and you need to tell it with flair mm -hmm. and make it powerful and interesting. So, yeah, I, 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 the, I, the worst kind of fundraiser I can think of is one who lies. About the eighth worst is one who underplays the seriousness of the situation that you're talking about. So, it, you know, it's far worse to be uh, overplaying things or uh, stretching the truth, but please um, don't hold your your uh, fire because you're afraid. Um, just make sure you're telling the truth all the time. Okay. Okay. Terrific. Well, let's take everybody to um, four strategies um, to enhance retention uh, through your donor relationships. So, if we could talk about these strategies, that would be great, Jeff. Yeah. Well, um, it's really important to think of fundraising not as a transaction but as a relationship. And there are transactional moments within the relationship, but really if, if all you do is transact, uh, you're not going to have good retention. You're not going to keep donors. You're not going to have people upgrading, uh, putting you in their will, and all those things that, that we hope they'll do that are so um, financially important to us. Uh, so first step beyond, you know, do really good fundraising that gets people to give, and that's just the first step. Um, think more about, you know, what, what is this in their life? Think about how it must feel to be a donor. In fact, research on donors who lapse and then donors who stop giving to organizations, so many of them say, well, I didn't think um, that they really needed my gift. And that's because that organization was failing to tell them that they matter. I mean, what a tragedy. And in fact, it's so bad out there, as in as the, the percentage of organizations that even bother to send an acknowledgement or receipt to their donors is so low, donors kind of think we're, all of us are a scam. That's actually kind of, their, one, of their, uh, one of their assumptions is, well, it's probably a scam, but I'll hope for the best, and they give anyway. They think, wow, what an amazing person that would do that. Um, but they do, and so we get some. But think of all these people who are saying, damn, I'm not going to give. So thank them. Really, really thank your donors and do it quickly and do it relevantly and thank them for the same thing you asked for. I mean, I know a lot of organizations they would say, we sent out a, a direct mail kit and it was Feed Hungry Children in Africa. They did a great job of making the case for that, and they got a lot of people to give. And then they sent a thank you note that said, Thank you for helping fight world poverty. Now, oh, yeah. you know, within the offices of that organization, that completely made sense because feeding hungry children and fighting world poverty is kind of the same thing. It's just different phases mm -hmm. of the exact same activity. But to the donors, it's not. I, I was thinking about the babies and how hungry they were, and, and I wanted to get food to them, and now they're here talking about this massively abstract thing of fighting world poverty. And again, donors don't probably think that clearly about it, but basically you're not thanking them more for what they did. And so your chance of mm -hmm. getting a subsequent gift kind of drops down to a lower level. So that's the importance of saying, hey, put as much thought and work and emotion into your thanking as you do in your, into your asking. Now the other thing to, to keep in mind here is a lot of us uh, do ineffective fundraising because we're actually fundraising from ourselves. We're basically saying, I got to say something that feels good to me. Uh, well, guess what? What feels good to you is almost always very unlike what actually works with donors. And in fact, I have a feeling what really works for you isn't what you think works for you because the, the conscious mind and the emotional <laughs> mind uh, are a little bit different. Uh, so, so thanking and being realistic about donors, uh, look at what they do not what you think they should do, and do the, that mm -hmm. kind of fundraising. And the, the other really important part of that is every donor should know what their dollars do 
And if you're really good at it, you're going to have donors out there telling the story. I gave to this organization, and look what I did. I made some great things happen, and they should, they should be happy and proud and clear about what their giving did. And if you do that, you're going to be one of very few donors, uh, very few organizations in any donor's uh, giving portfolio that even bothers to do that. And you will rise to the top of, of their favorite organizations, uh, newsletters being kind of the main tool for that. Newsletters that aren't mm -hmm. bragging about how excellent the organization is, but are basically telling donors, look what you did. Here's another story of what you did. Here's another story of what you did. Hey, and if that's not enough, here's yet another story. And that, that's how it just feels to them. It's like they're constantly being told uh, that you're, you're giving, A, we actually got it, B, we're not a scam, and C, you're changing the world. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, we touched on um, generations a couple slides ago, and that triggered a question from someone who said, you know, well, you know, isn't it important to be grooming younger donors and reaching them since they'll eventually be that, that older set that consistently likes to give? Do you want to comment at all on, on you know, younger generations and some of these strategies? Do they, do they apply? Um, realistically, young donors are people between 45 and 55. Um, mm -hmm. When you look, you know, when you look at who actually might be a donor, here's what happens. I I, I understand the the uh, the urge to say, well, let's talk to everybody, and maybe right. they'll start giving when they're young and have good experiences, and then then when they finally age into sort of full donor status at around age 60 or so, uh, they'll be more ready. Um, that is a very very expensive uh, course, so. People in their 20s and 30s and, and early 40s, um, very low retention, off the charts low retention, and and hard to get in the first place, hard to find. So it costs a lot of money, and you can do it. And in fact, um, there are some stories of where organizations have actually done it very well, and I think they might confuse us. I want to um, like the ice bucket challenge from about three, three summers ago, two summers ago, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that was a very effective way, and, and it was largely millennial, you know, people in their 20s and 30s who, who uh, get, got involved in that, and they gave them $115 million for uh, the ALS Society, uh, which is great. Um, well, I happen to know people in the ALS Society, and the management of ALS during the ice bucket has all been fired since then. Wow. Uh, because they took wow. the, they took their <laughs> – yeah, um, they took their eyes off the ball, which was keeping a meaningful um, older donor fundraising program going while all this craziness was happening. I can, you can completely see why it happened. How could you not spend all your time fostering this ice bucket thing? Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, the people who are there now, they look back at the ice bucket challenge. They say, well, that $115 million was great. It went to research, did all these good things, but it almost destroyed us as an ongoing fundraising concern because we did not basically did not keep any of those donors. And that, that's maybe the, um, that's kind of the hallmark of young donors is they'll do things in a sort of a fad driven way and they will do them in overwhelming numbers. Now, again, uh, it does not happen often. It happens rarely, rarely, rarely. If you think about it, it happens every few years to one organization out of the, in, what, 800,000 nonprofit organizations in this country. Um, mm -hmm. But then they don't keep them. So it's a mixed story. I think the Ice Bucket Challenge is actually one of the better examples where actually a very large amount of money was raised and actually did go to the cause. Uh, but in the end, it, they, the uh, ALS Society still has about the same size uh, donor file as it did before that. It kept very few. So all that to say, um, young donors are hard to get and even harder to keep, and you don't have the, I, I'm assuming, you don't have the budget to be their mother for the next four decades until they age into, um, you know, being the kind of donors who, who come with, get, are easier to get and stay with you. So I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I just wouldn't do it. What you should do is, that this is where you really need to be on top of things, is the almost old people on your, that, that are in your audience that care about your cause, people in their 40s and 50s who are getting close 
to that to that sort of switch over where the, the brain changes in brain chemistry that turn you into a, a good donor. Get those young those young people. That is how you build your future because they have um, they'll be with you a longer time. They're going to give you considerably higher average gifts, uh, and um, they'll, they will be the source of your future. So. I, I basically tell everybody, yes, 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 yes to young donors, but I'm talking about people 45 to 55 or 60. Okay, great. Well, and and I have a poll for everybody because it's a great segue to what we're talking about. We've talked about thanking donors and um, making sure to show them how they matter and thanking them specifically. Let's let's ask everybody this question. Um, should your donor thank you? Should your donor thank you letter start with thank you? Um, Jeff talks about this in one of his books, and I think it's an interesting point. So I'd love to hear what everybody has to say if they feel like their thank you letter should actually begin with a thank you. So thanks for weighing in and firing up those keyboards again, and. Um, We'll go ahead and get to our next questions. And it looks like the chat bar is firing up, so that's great too. Thanks everybody for submitting your questions. We'll get to those as we can. So that's great. Um, looks like our results are in. And we have 42% say you should start your thank you letter with thank you. Um, and then 40% 40, 40 say no. So you've, you've got, uh, I can't divide it here. So um, Jeff, do you want to talk about this a little bit? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I said, and uh, I wrote somewhere, that you shouldn't uh, start the, with the word, just don't start a uh, thank you letter with the word thank you. I kind of want to rescind that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love it. Okay, great. Why. Tell us yeah. why. Well, Tell us why. Here's why I said that. Uh, I think if you, when you, I mean, that's the most natural thing to do, and that's actually a good reason to do it. The, the reason not to would be challenge yourself. Find a, find a different way of starting your thank you. So, so, yeah, I think I would have voted not sure if you asked me if I had taken that poll. <laughs> um, I, I would say, yeah, uh, try something else other than the first two words of your thank you letter being thank you, but it's not a terrible thing to do. Um, you know, that's Probably your thank you letter to your to your grandma when she sends you a sweater. It's probably thank you, so it, it's okay, um, and um, it's maybe just a challenge to push yourself and see what see what you can do that might maybe get their attention in a different way. Great. Okay. Well, we've got on this slide here how to turn your your thank you into a PR opportunity. And you've highlighted some don'ts here. Are there any you want to talk about? Sure. Um, yeah, okay. Be, be really careful to remember that there's a big don't about these. They're all things not to do. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> um, well, I, you know what? I might say that the biggest problem here uh, that, that, that kind of happens, <laughs> thank you, is uh, don't take too <laughs> long to respond. I, I think a lot of organizations take far too long to respond. And um, make it your goal to, to uh, send out your thank you to somebody within 24 hours of receiving the gift. I think that's a top priority for every organization. And if you're not there, move as fast as you can toward that. I know that it can be a challenge, but it's just a systems thing. It's, it's a completely fixable thing. I mean, come on. I, I, I just ordered... Uh, a teapot from Amazon, and it came to me in 24 hours. The teapot came. They got it off of a shelf, a specific item out of millions of items, and they got it to me. You can print a thing and get it out in 24 hours. Again, I understand that there's a logistic issues there, and it probably is a budget question too, but please, please do it, because here's what happens. People send a gift. They get a warm glow. It's a well-documented thing. It happens in the chemistry of our brains that when we give, we feel physically good. And if the receipt comes while we still remember that feeling, it actually fires up again. And they go, oh, yeah, that's right. That was so wonderful. Well, there's organizations that are taking weeks and even months to say thank you. They get the thank you. They don't even remember. They don't remember the way it felt. They probably don't even remember sending the gift. Uh, um, you know, most donors, most good donors, are giving to 6, 10, 15 organizations, and they might, they're not necessarily really clear who you are. Uh, and so when you let the time pass, basically they lapse. They go away before
before you've even thanked them. So get that thing out there quick. If you aren't, if you aren't doing it in 24 hours, find your way toward that goal. Awesome. Well, you've, um, this thank you topic has, uh, has lit up the chat bar, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a couple here. Um, okay. Somebody's curious about um, if you are not starting a thank you letter with thank you, what might be a good example of, of not doing that? Um, what would be an alternative way of doing that? You might, uh, you might start with a story about somebody whose life is impacted, so you, it might be, let me tell you about Bill. He used to live under a bridge, but thanks to you, he now uh, has an apartment of his own and, and a job and is a, is a tax-paying, wonderful citizen. So you could start with a story. Uh, that's probably, that would be sort of my preferred way to, to go at it. Um, okay. But really anything, yeah, yeah almost, almost any way where you, this, this is kind of a writer's trick, isn't it, where you say, well, there's an obvious way to do this. And that doesn't mean it's bad, but if I try a less mm -hmm. obvious way, maybe it will push me to do something more with, with the writing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so our next thank you question is um, someone's asking about thank yous as they relate to special events. They say, if you're having an event, should you send thank yous when the item is donated for the event or after the event is over? What do you think is more appropriate? Huh. I'm not sure I know. I, my, my instinct would be when they donate it, and then maybe again mm -hmm. <laughs> when, it's, uh, yeah. when it's sold. Um, that, it, yeah. it does seem like that, uh, again, kind of depending on how important that is to you. That is, yeah. The more valuable yeah. item, the more things you probably want to do. Okay, great. Well, and then we have a question about length of the letter. How long should the thank you letter be? As long as you can afford it to be. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, well, here's the thing. Uh, to, to get them out in 24 hours, you probably have a, have a very uh, efficient system that's probably going to limit you to um, some portion of a, of a form, and it's going to tend to be a kind of a, mm -hmm. th a short letter. Uh, if that's what it takes to get out in 24 hours, great. Send out a short thank you letter just so you can get it out. But, you know, we, we know in um, uh, asking that the longer the letter, the more response you get. So I'd kind of, I'd love to send like a five or a ten page thank you letter uh, and see mm -hmm. what happens. Uh, yeah. Big logistical challenge. I mean, it's a, a way easier said than done. In fact, I don't, I've never had the opportunity to do that in 30 years. Although, if you, uh, you know, actually <laughs> in major donor fundraising where it's a one-to-one -one sort of thing, that actually happens all the time. Of course, like somebody gives a, a five-figure gift and, and the major donor um, officer will do whatever it takes to thank that person properly. And, and they'll, they'll know the person a little bit and say, you know what, I'm going to write a really long thank you letter that talks on and on and on about the difference they've made. So it does happen in that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where you can afford to do it. Um, but no, I, I, you know, I'd rather you write a really short one and get it out fast than that you kind of do the okay. dream thing and do a super long one. Uh, there is actually a category of thanking uh, that I've, I've done a, a lot in the past, which is basically it's not thank you for this specific gift, but it's thank you for being a donor. And that mm -hmm. tends to be a kind of a longer letter because you sort of talk about things that are going on and the change that's happening in the world, and you keep saying and it's all because of you. Uh, and that would, you could call that, that's a long thank you letter. It's just not tied to a specific gift that came at a specific date. A uh, good thing to do, by the way. It's, I call it a donor affirmation letter, and they do have a okay. positive impact on retention. Great. Okay, well, we have, uh, we're going to take one more thank you question and move on. Uh, the thank you question is, um, is your time for sending out thank you letters, if it's longer than 24 hours, does a brief thank you video with a link to the video from the organization help? Have you seen any success with thank you videos, Jeff? I have. Yeah, it's a great thing to do. Okay. Uh, and absolutely, you should do it. It does not replace okay. the letter. Right? But absolutely do it, and it will, it will mitigate the problem if you're not getting um, paper letters to people quickly. So yeah, it's a great thing to do. Okay, 
wonderful. All right, well, moving on, we are going to ask what are important style techniques to include when writing fundraising copy? We touched briefly on this um, earlier, but if you would love to expand on any of these bullets, that would be great. Yeah. Um, well, I, I might, I'm going to bring out the long messages thing. I said something about that earlier, and people don't believe me when I say that, but it is one of the most well-documented fundraising truths is that longer, in direct mail, longer letters almost always work better than shorter letters. It's freaky, it's weird, it's counterintuitive, but it's absolutely true. Um, the only time I've seen shorter letters work better are in just sort of special situations, emergencies, uh, you know, like the, the Haiti earthquake, where everybody knows what's going on. You're just kind of wasting your breath talking too much about it or just quickly uh, mm -hmm. get to it. That's the rare exception. And here's what's even weirder. It's true in email, too. Longer emails, in general, work better than shorter emails. So uh, take that. I, I, again, um, believe me, I, it's, it's, it's as clear a truth as I can tell because I've tested it many times. Um, it's just hard to believe, and it's hard for people to uh, do that. But when you're, if you're struggling to get your letters short because you think that's going to make them work better, you are completely wasting your time. You're, you'd be way better off just letting it, letting it flow. I would write 10-page, okay. 12-page letters all the time. It's just that they're kind of in direct mail. They're kind of not affordable. I think typically the letters I write are four pages, two sheets put in back, four pages. Um, okay. The other thing, and, and some people struggle with, is that you know, the bullet point on accessibility, and, and I call that readability. Um, you mm -hmm. want to keep your stuff. Short, you want to you want to sort of avoid longer words, and you want to run your copy through a a, um, flesh, a flesh Kincaid readability score, and you want it to be at about sixth grade. Now, that's about readability. It's not about education. I, I, what I always hear is I say, be at sixth grade and see how, but our donors are college educated. That's great. In fact, most donors are college educated. Um, it's not a, it's not talking down to them to write in the sixth grade. It's basically to talk loudly and clearly. Um, you know how it is with your, with your grandparents and you talk to them and they, and they struggle because their hearing isn't as good as yours. Uh, it's kind of rude. They, they think you're mumbling. Uh, so, you know, if you have your act together, when you're talking to grandma and grandpa, you, you raise your voice and you talk a little slower to, so you can communicate with them. That is just human decency. Mm -hmm. So you have to be that way with your fundraising. It's just make it easy. Uh, the best driver in the world likes an easy commute. Right? It's not like, yeah, right. I'm a great driver. I want a challenging commute. No, they all want an easy commute. Make your fundraising easy. No matter how educated okay. they are, they will appreciate that. Okay, what about, what about photos with uh, your fundraising letter? We have a question about that. Good, good or bad or indifferent? Uh, maybe good. It can be a challenge. Um, because again, uh, like I was saying earlier about how the sometimes the photo and the message are uh, contradicting. If you have a photo that does not tell the same story as your letter, then you should not use it. That's a big, big mistake. Mm -hmm. It will undermine everything else. You can write the best letter in the world, but the photo says, "No, no problem. So you don't have to give." Um, so I, okay. I tend to shy away from them, but sometimes there's a great photo that's perfect, and I, I would use it in, in cases like that. Uh, one caveat would be the way is the way with where you put it. Um, if you put the, a photo at the bottom of the page, nobody will mm -hmm. read the copy that's above it. The eye goes to photos okay. first, and the eye tends to drop down. So put it at the top of the okay. page. If you're really be careful that you're telling the same story with the photo. Okay, great. And then uh, we have a couple organizations that are on the smaller side, and they, they say they do quite often they write handwritten letters. What's your opinion on handwritten versus typewritten? Handwritten letters are great. Um, okay. They, they feel good. They get the attention. I, the only downside is you, you kind of can't write a really long handwritten letter. I guess you could. It's just, it's just it's a big challenge. Um, but even yeah. – um, even print, you know, fake printed handwritten letters are, are a powerful thing to do. It's um, it, okay. it's warm. It's good. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Well, let's um, have everybody vote again on our next poll, and we're going to shift gears to um, what belongs at the center of your fundraising copy. Is it your organizational accomplishments, the donor, or not sure? And Jeff, you aren't allowed to vote not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and uh, let's see here. Looks like we got some good votes in. Thanks, everybody. So we have um, the donor. Yay. Okay. 57% are voting on the donor. Organizational accomplishments, 20 accomplishments, 20%. Uh, not sure, 20%. So um, let's talk about that a little bit more. So. Yeah. Um, uh, in general, which principles should fundraising copy include? Do you want to comment on any of these, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, I definitely would have voted donor on that one. That's uh, unequivocally true, that you need to write to the donor okay. about the donor and not brag about okay. how awesome you are. Okay. You know, okay. I hope you're awesome. If you're not awesome, I hope you'll <laughs> become, become so. Um, but uh, they're not going to give because you're awesome. They're going to give because you persuade them that you are a good tool for them. So donor, donor, donor. That's the only thing to re that really matters. Um, these uh, these principles here, um, these are all matter. Maybe I'll just kind of walk quickly through them. Um, uh, stories are the, what best communicate to people. So you can say, it's like, here's, you know, the example I, I see a lot is there's a statistic out there that 28,000 children die every day from hunger. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it, it might be. And, and that's a terrible, terrible thing to say in fundraising. That is not a reason to give. That's a reason not to give. You've got to stay away from that. You've got to tell the story of a, a hungry child. Nobody uh, uh, is moved by large numbers. Uh, Joseph Stalin said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic, and it's absolutely true. Uh, and statistics don't touch people in the heart. So tell stories. Uh, also, keep it simple. You really aren't going to get people to give by explaining how your program works. You're not going to educate them into giving. You need to strip it down to its bare essentials of what's going to happen. Uh, and that and you really, if okay. you do those two things, that is that is centering on the donor. Okay, perfect. Um, we also have someone asking about uh, photos here, and I I know you you feel. You feel very specifically about this answer. Uh, she says, we tested happy versus sad photos, and it didn't seem to make a difference in the response. This is something we constantly discuss. So which, which side do you come down on, Jeff? Uh, generally on uh, sad. Uh, it's a really complicated okay. question, <laughs> uh, and I don't think we could say you must always use a sad photo and not a happy photo. Um, in general, though, if you want if you want people to understand that there's a problem, you want to you don't want a, a happy photo which can lead them the wrong direction. Really, what I think is the, a better way to think about it is uh, sad when you're asking, happy when you're thinking is, is is maybe a better way of thinking about it. Again, it's really okay. complicated, and there's there's more than happy versus sad. There are other issues in every image that might have more weight than that question. Okay. Um, we also have a question needing clarification. So this person says, I'm confused about the drama aspect and not using statistics. Uh, we use statistics as part of our drama. Should we use specific stories for the drama and not large statistics? You should. Um, okay, this is weird. I, I know, um, uh, but testing has shown that if you tell a story and also talk to, uh, and also give statistics, in other words, you might say, Here's uh, so, uh, little little so and so who is in, in under threat because sh she and her family are hungry. She's one of 21 million that are caught up in this terrible famine. When you do that, you cut uh, response tens of percentage points down. Uh, okay. I know that seems weird. It's better to tell this story and not tell the statistics. Statistics actually turn our compassion off because basically. We hear statistics all the time. We are we mm -hmm. swim in a sea of statistics, and I think I think they're meaningless. And in fact, I think, and 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 some of the research shows shows this to be true is that people who don't donate to charity, in other words, who have not 
brought this wonderful life transforming thing into their lives, it's because they think they can't make a difference. They say, it's just a sucker's yeah. game. I can't change the world. And that's because they believe the statistics and they don't believe the story. We would, if we would stop using statistics and start using stories, I think we'd bring in a whole sector of our population into the donating public that is not there now because they believe they can't make a difference. They're thinking about the 30,000 children who died yesterday and today and tomorrow, and they're thinking, I can't do anything about that. But if they, if they are thinking the way you should, which is, well, if I do my part, I can make a difference. And that's what story does. Okay. What about the organizations who, who aren't in the sad photo space, for example, cultural or performing arts? Have you seen them yeah. successfully um, do something else? Yeah, um, I, I, they, I think they have a rather different set of rules because I'm not sure what even a sad photo would be for an arts organization. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I suppose it, I mean, it's, it's like a picture of the art not happening, which is what's that. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think yeah, exactly. it's almost like that, that idea kind of doesn't apply to cultural and arts organizations. Okay. You generally okay. want to show the art. Yeah, that, that's generally what your photo is going to be which I guess I'd call a happy photo. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. I, what is it? I, we, you okay. want to show a violinist with no violin in, in her hands? I, I, I don't know what, the, what that would be. Yeah, yeah. That is a good question. Um, and then we also have a question about types of stories that work best. Um, this person says, stories about the problem or stories about how our volunteers are solving the problem. Please give us more examples. We address Ocean and water issues, the problems are far away, but we are making a difference through outreach and education. So the question is, you know, do we talk about the actual problem or do we tell stories about how our volunteers are solving the problem? Well, you want to do both, but you want to, if you want people to give, you need to talk about the problem. Um, you need to say, here's what's going on. Here's why you should care. This is a big deal. You really need to give. And you want to do it with story mm -hmm. and with, with word pictures and all that. Um, I, I guess I, the way I think about it is you also need to show them that their giving makes a difference, but that's a secondary thing. You need to say, when you give, you really will make a difference. Here's what's going to happen. Then later on when you're thanking them and reporting back, then you tell great stories about the solution and the way the solution is happening and how good it is and how permanent it is and how people are being uh, – how volunteers' lives are changing and how, uh, you know, tell the full story of the greatness when you're thanking them, but really focus on the problem when you're asking them. Okay, great. Well, and we, we have a question, an interesting kind of sidebar question about the board's role in this type of fundraising. Um, you know, have you ever seen organizations successfully mine board members for good stories or um, do board members still get involved in signing letters? How have you seen boards get involved? Um, I've seen a lot more boards screw things up than, than make things look good. <laughs> in, 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 okay. I'm sorry to say that, but um, it, it's just the truth. Now, board members should be involved in fundraising. Um, you just don't want them editing your stuff. They will kill it. I promise you they will kill it Okay. Uh, because they, they aren't fundraising professionals. They're professionals in other ways. Um, yeah. Board members signing uh, appeals and things like that, great. That's fine. The only problem is that it, it might open the door to them editing it and saying, uh, this isn't going to work, and, you, and, um, and you're sort of stuck. You know, um, that's my signature. Yeah. I get to it. But, so I, I tend to keep um, – board members at an arm's length from your sort of general public fundraising, but get them as involved as possible with events and working their own networks and, and then that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay, great. Good advice. Well, let's jump to some deadly myths to avoid. Um, so to keep retention strong, what are three deadly fundraising myths we want to avoid? Do you want to talk about these? Sure, yeah. Well, all three of these statements here are are uh, untrue. They are myths, and uh, and and I, we're talking about them because they're widely believed myths. Um, a lot of organizations have this terrible fear that they're going to send one too many fundraising letters, and then and their donors will revolt, and you'll lose them all. 
it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. It, it just never happens that way. Um, basically, now that this, I'll say this with some caution, but basically the more you ask, the more you will get. It's, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, and actually the real thing is the more you ask smartly the right people at the right time in the right way, the more you'll get. Um, but don't think that sending too much mail is something that's going to cause you a problem. It never, it, I've never seen it cause a problem. And I've worked with organizations that were sending out um, 20 plus direct mail pieces a year plus newsletters and, and, and other things like that. And, and basically revenue keeps going up. Uh, so okay. if, you're sending, if you're sending four appeals, you are not sending enough. You should send five. And I don't know how many the upper limit is for you. It's really almost kind of a budget and a capacity question. But don't tell yourself, I'm going to chase away donors by asking. Donors donate. Um, what, what does happen is your, your uh, efficiency can go down when you're asking a lot because the, you know, mm-hmm. you're sending a lot more than people actually can give. Okay, the other one that's kind of related to that is a lot of organizations will have a policy where if somebody gives, we stop talking to them for two, three, four months because they, they kind of need a rest from us. So damaging, so terrible thing to do. The, okay. the top indicator of likeliness to give is the recency of the previous gift. It, it Basically, when somebody gives, they're highly likely to give within the next month, two months, and three months. After that, it drops, and it drops off the table. So if you wait four months before you start talking to them again, their chance of giving is is just a fraction of what it was if you got back to them right away. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid. There's, there's no harm in getting back to them. In fact, people give because giving feels good. And if you do a good job of asking and a good job of thanking, you're going to get people who are giving frequently. But don't give them a rest. Okay. Just keep, keep the asking. Make sure it's good and keep it coming. Uh, another thing that happens is um, three people call up the boss and say, I hated this fundraising campaign you did. And so we cancel the campaign. Uh, that happens a lot. Now, what they didn't look at was, yeah, but 4,000 people donated. Listen to the response, not to the complainers. The complainers kind of tell you nothing. All they tell you is how they feel. Uh, and surprisingly often, the complainers are non-donors or last donors or you know, three dollars six months ago donors, people like that. Those are people more likely to complain. And the better your fundraising is, the more complaints you're going to get. Uh, because a great fundraising kind of creates an ultimatum, doesn't it? It's basically saying, mm-hmm. here's a real problem. It's really important. You need to be involved. And there's somebody reading that saying, yeah, but I can't or I don't want to. And that puts them in a difficult yeah. place. And they become likely to complain. When someone complains, mm-hmm. don't think of it as a, a, a condemnation of what you've done. Think of it as a possible way to connect with that person. That's all it is. Okay. And you might not be able to connect with them, but a very surprising lot, and you can. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I, I remember working for an organization years ago where we used to keep a binder of all the complaints we received because we would go back to that binder and it would help us generate ideas of how, of how we could be communicating with our donors. So oftentimes when you get a complaint, it's you know, because somebody cares enough to respond, and those are the, those are the vested people. So um, I love that you make that point. Right. Yeah, this is actually good. And, and really, yeah, somebody who, who bothers to complain. They're either just a sour quiz, which some of them are, and you're not going to get through, but most of them are right. They're doing because they care. They want to make it right, and they want to talk. So use you know use mm-hmm. that as a as a as an opportunity. Okay, great. Well, before we transition um, at the top of the hour, I just wanted to address. We had a few technical questions on formatting. I think we can answer pretty quickly. Um, annual reports. What are you seeing? Um, are you seeing more success with print or digital, or have you have you seen any testing on that? Um, no, I haven't seen testing. Um, I have seen very few annual reports that were worth doing at all. Uh, uh, it, it, it's expensive, and to most donors, it's not interesting. Um, I, I think maybe the best version I've seen, and, and I've seen this in quite a few places, is it's a little more, it's like a news, uh, newsletter, um, and it has annual reports. Okay. 
type information. And that, that seems to work pretty well. It's a lot cheaper. Um, but yeah, don't, uh, I would not put a whole lot of emphasis on your, uh, your annual report as a fundraising tool. You might be mandated that okay. you have to do it um, and make it available and things like that, but it's, it's really hard to make work. It's, it's just not interesting to the pretty large majority of donors. Okay. Okay, great. And then we had a question about um, using photos of children. What's the best practice there? Do they use, obviously with permission, but do they use um, alternate names to protect identity and things of that nature? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's kind of a product of your policy um, and, and how, you, how you deal with your, your, your beneficiaries. Um, but yeah, using, uh, like saying, using a different name and saying that's not, that's, this is not her real name, that, that's fine. Um, and yeah, permission is really important and because you, re, you, know, you, you have a debt to those people to treat them properly and, and respect their privacy. So, you know, getting not only a kid's permission, but probably a guardian's permission as well. Um, and, you know, sometimes for privacy reasons, I've had people put a black bar across the eyes. If there's some reason we want to show the child, but we really want to protect their privacy in some way. There, there's, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, okay. And I'm not, I'm not sure what the best practices are, but you've got you, you to do the right thing. 